So on behalf of the Paul K. Longmore Institute on Disability, it's my extreme privilege to welcome you to today's event, the launching of Paul's uh, final book. My name is Gene Schelberg, and I am a proud member of the Institute's Advisory Council. I was extremely fortunate to have known and counted Paul Longmore as a friend, mentor, and colleague. It's hard to believe that we're gathered here approximately five and a half years since his untimely death. I remember clearly one of my last interactions with Paul. Per usual, he steamrolled into my office, not uh, caring if I was in the midst of anything important. <laughs> Uh, how could anything I was doing, after all, be more important than either Paul or what he had to say? Does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> Paul was going on about his latest book and a possible uh, federal award that he was going to receive uh, that would support uh, completion of said book. He was pissed off that, once again, Social Security regulations were going to prevent him from taking that award but he was all fired up to burn more books. <laughs> so as I said, here we are five and a half years later, celebrating the publication of that very same book. Not completed by Paul, but by an extremely dedicated, extraordinary group of close friends and scholars. If Paul's watching us gather here today, think inside, he might be humbled. But on the outside, he'd be saying, well, of course you finished it. <laughs> so very pleased to be a part of today's celebration. Uh, if you haven't noticed already, books are for sale in the back at a 30% discount. And I'm just so pleased to be a part of a university that has been able to not only honor, but to carry on uh, and build upon the legacy of Paul Longmore. It's my extreme privilege to get to introduce to you all Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs, Sue Rosser, without whose support, we probably wouldn't be here celebrating the Institute, Paul's archives, and possibly not even the book. So Sue, thank you for your ongoing dedication and support of the Institute. Welcome. Thank you very much, Jean, for those kind remarks. I'm so honored and pleased to be here this afternoon at this event and to welcome all of you to San Francisco State and to once again celebrate both Paul Longmore and the Longmore Institute and all that it's doing for our students at San Francisco State and actually for the whole country. Uh, as you probably know, Paul Longmore actually worked on telethons pretty much the whole time he was here. This was some of the work that he was doing in pursuing his scholarship. Uh, I don't mean to say that this stopped him from uh, publishing other books and doing myriad of work and events around the campus, around the city, and around the country. Um, but this was something in which he was very interested, to look at the connection between telethons and culture. Uh, Paul Longmore was one of the folks uh, of whom I had heard before I came to San Francisco State. And in fact, I was familiar with his second book, um, Why I Burned by Book, and some of the circumstances that led to it, which as Jean alluded, uh, was this whole business with uh, Social Security and what this was gonna mean, the fact that he couldn't receive the royalties for that book and how that really spurred him to start uh, some of the activism and the disability movement in the United States uh, down in Los Angeles. I remember uh, attending his memorial service and I was able, amazingly enough, to find in my files uh, the uh, program and booklet that was produced uh, about the memorial service. 
And I do recall now when I read back through this that he was very close to finishing this book, and that was one of the things that he was really very happy again uh, about. And as Jean said, he would sometimes roll into my office also <laughs> and talk about things, although usually there was a little different flavor. He was asking for money, as I recall. <laughs> he, he may have had uh, different conversations with each of us in the room, depending on uh, what was the uh, thing that was on his mind. But he was always working towards advancing disability rights, his own scholarship, and the activist position that we all know it was so important. So we're very pleased that with the help of Kathy Kudlick, who is now heading up the Longmore Institute, and we were thrilled to recruit her to keep uh, this going. And uh, we were also very pleased that, of course, she knew Paul, that she was also a historian, it did not uh, escape our attention that she might be able to help complete the book, which she has now done. So we're all very pleased about that, and I'm happy to si have the signed copy of this. It's now my pleasure to introduce Meredith uh, Eleison of Special Collections, which houses the Longmore Institute, and this is another honor for San Francisco State, and she'll talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you. Welcome to the University Archives, and welcome on behalf of all of the special collections in the J. Paul Leonard Library. This is where the K. Paul Longmore papers are housed. First, I've been asked to read a statement by the project archivist who processed the Longmore papers, colleague Kate Kat Tasker, who is now the digital archivist at the Bancroft Library who could n unfortunately not be here today. I had the honor of getting to know Paul through his papers for six months in 2013 when I worked with Kathy and the Longmore Institute to preserve Paul's records. I met a brilliant scholar, a wickedly funny writer, and an asto astonishingly determined man. I filed the paperwork resulting from Paul's constant struggle to get the California State Department of Rehabilitation to support his education and the supplemental security income forms which symbolize his battle to earn an income and his ultimate victory to amend the National Social Security Act. I read Paul's letters from and to many students he mentored and the others he inspired. I organized mat the meticulously cited research files, which hardly needed any organizing, exclamation point, which illustrated the progress of Paul's career from his earliest high school papers to his PhD dissertation to his first public published book and beyond. I also filed hundreds of hours of telethon TV segments recorded on home VSH tapes. It's a huge amount of content and one, a one-of-a-kind collection of such comprehensive and specific footage. And there were research notes and manuscript drafts devoted to telethons. It's a magnificent um, amount of material, over half of the 151 boxes uh, in Paul's voluminous research files. Now for my thoughts. The Paul K. Longmore papers have been open for about two years. They have drawn international scholars to the university archives. They contain his papers related to research and teaching, and researchers have particularly been interested in the material related to the League of the Physically Handicapped which was active during the Great Depression. Longmore was not just a pioneering historian focused on disability studies and bioethics. He was a noted scholar on the colonial period of American history and George Washington. I got to know Paul as one of his students. I grew up in a family where disability was part of the conversation. So after he came to San Francisco State, in 1992, I sought him out. 
in putting together the, the display, which is in the back of the room, I was also struck by the communication from his students. I was wowed, contemplating the profound impact that his teaching and mentoring had on my own career. Paul recruited me to get materials from our Archer collection of historic children's materials into the Disability History Museum. And this became my first experience digitizing our collections. I realized that the projects related to my work here that I've been most proud of came right out of his teaching. In particular, a guide I compiled about our KPIX AIDS collection, now in the television archive, um, which is a significant work. When I described the project to Paul and told him about my doubts about doing the work, after all, I'm not a medical historian, <laughs> his resp he responded, Meredith, if you don't do it, who will? And that was enough for me. The Paul Longmore d papers also demonstrate how scholars with disabilities use this library. Longmore really worked our interlibrary loan department to get the documents, to get a lot of the documents that he needed for that were not documents that he collected himself from the daily newspapers and taping things off air. What we have here in his archives, we don't have copyright to. However, what we have here is Longmore's fantastically strategic logic that never wasted time or energy. I continue to, partn to partner with our interlibrary loan department to deliver documents, to deliver access to, uh, to researchers in other regions who might have trouble getting to the university. Longmore was an activist and he taught activism. We have a photograph of him in the back participating in a book burning event. Longmore t started teaching his disabilities in America class as part of the History 490 series, Topics in American History. However, Longmore did not just teach students about history. He taught students about their own life and times. We reviewed his VHS recordings of telethons and discussed what they really meant. As Kate mentioned, Longmore recorded telethons taking copious notes that were later uh, transcribed. Longmore taught students to engage with and interpret moving image primary sources with a disability lens, utilizing multiple pers perspectives. Longmore was an ardic ardent critic of popular culture, fearless and unrelenting in confronting networks, editors, you name it. I, the correspondence is phenomenal uh, when necessary. He introduced his students to all kinds of media related to disabilities in order to teach critical thinking skills. In 2006, Longmore received the prestigious California State Wang Family Excellence Award in recognition for his pioneering work in the field of disability studies and for exemplary work as a teacher and mentor. Now, let me introduce you, and he needs no introduction, <laughs> to history professor Trevor Getz, Longmore's closest colleague and friend here at San Francisco State. Welcome. Um, thank you all. Um, I'll introduce myself as a member of the Longmore Institute Advisory Council, a friend of Paul's, and a member of the History Department. I am going to cry. Um, yeah, Gene, I was hoping you would tear up a little bit. OK, good. So <laughs> I've also gone for brief, because um, otherwise I won't make it through. Um, Paul was my very good friend. He was actually very good friends with a lot of people in this room. Uh, Paul was very good at being uh, friends. Um, and there are a lot of people out there who are sort of unsung heroes, uh, both as Paul's friends and for the things that they've done to advance this book since he passed away. Um, I'll admit that Paul and I didn't actually talk about telethons that often. Uh, don't get me wrong, we talked sometimes about this book coming up and his feelings about MDA and Jerry Lewis 
And in fact, he often brought up the question of what would happen to this book if he passed away in an almost prescient way. But he was a fascinating and unorthodox scholar, and his worth took him many different places. He was an amazing and patient mentor, see? Um, once he knew you had an ego that could match his, uh, he would especially be a good mentor. Um, and he taught us about identity, uh, you know, not just about disability, but about the way identity works, the way it's constructed, and the way it's contested. Uh, in my case, it was about the nation and nationalism, and I quickly found that giving him a paper, a chapter to read about nation building in West Africa, meant that I'd be barraged with two million suggestions about readings that I hadn't done, and concepts I hadn't heard about uh, before, and even after I thought I was done with that chapter, it would come back again and again. He taught us about culture and the way it operated, not in theory, but in actuality, through observable events and shifting attitudes uh, across the country, on TV, and on campus. And he taught us about power. Uh, as you can hear from the other speakers up here, Paul knew how to exert soft power actually amazingly well by showing up at some vice president's office and talking to the, I see Provost Rosser nodding, talking to the, the administrative staff um, or sort of barging in and talking to a vice president or meeting a dean on the quad and somehow wheedling out uh, something that he wanted or making a suggestion about why things needed to change. Uh, he taught us about money and the way it operates uh, in insidious ways in interesting ways. He didn't shy away from it. He started a development, a departmental development committee to make sure that the history department was going after money at a time when most of us were allergic to the idea. But he would also happily tell you about the way that money operated to keep him within bonds that didn't allow him to go out and to do the kinds of things that most of us expect to be able to do. A righteous answer that eventually became the act of rebellion in which he burned his book, a defining act, but not the only defining act of his career. The interesting thing is that all of these matters are in the book before you, um, and it's a book that is quite incredible. Yes, Paul had done a lot of the work and gotten much of the way there, but um, it took a heck of a lot of editing, not for me, terrible editor, um, but from those who did the editing work to get it into uh, the amazing book that it is, in fact, uh, in front of you, a book that weaves together culture and identity, the operation of power, the corrupting flows of money into a story that's ultimately about people and their subjugation to a system that claimed to be about them, but that was really about their objectification. In the end, Paul was about scholarship that made a difference to people, to the societies they lived in, to the experience that they felt. It's amazing how many things Paul can teach us, even though he's no longer with us. But I want to end on an up note, if you will, um, because although Paul left us, the Longmore Center, the Longmore Institute is here, and it's actually an amazing place on campus. And this gives me the opportunity to introduce somebody um, who has really been Paul's successor and carried on his legacy, who's done amazing things, not just this book, not just uh, museum exhibits, but amazing things on this campus and amazing things that have a national implication. And that's the director of the Paul K. Inst Paul K. Longmore Institute on Disability Studies, Kathy Kudlick. Thank you. Wow. Um, uh, this podium is at an interesting angle, and there's lots going on yeah. here. <laughs> okay, no water. But, uh, um, anyway, thank you so much, Trevor. Thank you, Provost Rosser. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, um, Jean. Thank you, everybody um, who uh, presented and kind of helped me set up this thing as I'm setting up this other thing. Um, I just, it's, it's an amazing day. I just cannot believe uh, that I'm here. It's so thrilling to have you all here with me to celebrate this amazing accomplishment um, of our colleague and friend and, and everyone. And um, we're just, it's, it's five years of work since he died. We've been working on it, um, not every second, but many seconds. Um, and um, I think that, you know, this is a crowning achievement of a great scholar activist, and I'm thrilled to have you here to celebrate with me. Um, all right, come on, Jane. So, okay. All right. Um, I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes, 
Um, and then I'm going to show a short video of Paul Longmore lecturing um, on Skype. <laughs> Um, and then I'll conclude with a few more brief remarks. <clears throat> okay. Paul Longmore blows away how we think about a group that makes up approximately 20% of the U.S. population. Disability is the one minority all of us can instantly join and one that will affect anyone who grows old. Even if we don't identify as part of this population, disability touches our families, friends, communities, policy, architecture, physical and social environments, and how we think of ourselves in relation to others. Four years ago, I left my comfortable 20-year perch at UC Davis to direct the Longmore Institute because I believed that Paul had opened a door. Too few people knew about that door, and even fewer appreciated that a beautiful expanse lay beyond it. To push open Paul's door that would lead to an exciting uncharted world, I knew that I faced three intimidating tasks. One, to have his papers safely housed where others could learn from them. Two, to complete and publish the telethons book that he had been working on for over two decades. And three, to build something audacious from the institute that bears his name. Meredith, and through her, Kate, just told us about the papers. So let me turn to the man and the book and then conclude with some thoughts about what these things mean for the Longmore Institute and the future justice of San Francisco State, at San Francisco State University. At his memorial in 2010, Paul Longmore's sister told the story um, of how he freaked out a young cashier by asking if he should take the March of Dimes canister on the counter right then because they were going to be giving it to him anyway. <laughs> um, he lived with the effects of childhood polio, describing himself as a reverse hunchback. He also suffered from the debilitating effects of navigating the U.S. social security and healthcare systems. And he struggled against prejudice because of the unusual physical appearance, be it from, um, he, he was um, prejudiced from people on the street or from teachers and colleagues. By all accounts, he was a force of nature who never settled, as I'm, I hope everybody learned from the comments just now. He changed every person who came into contact with him. His dissertation-based book, The Invention of George Washington, and his two edited collections, The New Disability History, co-edited with Lori Umansky, and Why I Burn My Book and Other Essays on Disability, along with dozens of pieces, revealed a passionate scholar activist who influenced generations of students and colleagues here at State and beyond. I first met Paul at a Society for Disability Studies conference in 1995 after swallowing my pride to demand why he hadn't answered a heartfelt letter I'd written to him two years earlier. At the time, I was, a ter I was terrified and insecure about my vision impairment yet somehow knew that my life depended on reaching out to this legendary guy who got it about disability and about history. As we became close friends and shared work, we often joked about the great re um, response I would be getting any day. <laughs> <laughs> then unexpectedly, he died in 2010. No letter. Yet in the many hours I wrangled with the phenomenal telethon text, I found his responses to me and to the world on every page. It was a giant dare, one he typed first with a pencil clutched in his mouth to press keys, and later with dictation software. He dared me and the small team I assembled of those who believed in his book to pull the many strands together so his ideas would spread and open the door for lasting change. I believed enough in what was there and what is here to put aside my own scholarship and convinced others to do the same. Finishing the book of a beloved colleague and friend is intimate work. Finishing a book that the author openly referred to as his magnum opus, a book eagerly awaited by a demanding disability community, community hungry for his wit and insight was daunting to say the least. Now that the book is out, Waiting for the reviews from people near and far explains my short fingernails. 
The book, Telethons, Spectacle, Disability, and the Business of Charity, is revolutionary, revolutionary and paradigm shifting. These are not words that immediately come to mind when recalling weekend long TV programs that featured kitschy entertainment, celebrities of every stripe, and pathetic handicapped children struggling on crutches. Longmore shows how telethons, by piggybacking on the new media of television, help transform, tra help transform fundraising and public relations. The programs also brought disability and disabled people who had long been isolated and hidden into the public in previously unimaginable ways. Paul, Paul argued three basic points. Telethons flourished by exploiting the US health and welfare systems and promoted a false sense that disabled people were taken care of. Second, telethons needed disabled people more than disabled people needed telethons. And three, telethons trained Americans how to think about their bodies and how to fear disability. There is, of course, much more. The book takes on big business and corporate relations, historical roots of American feelings about volunteering and what it means to be generous, how we, disabled or not, think about our bodies, our families, our prospects in life. He also explores how disability rights expanded even as activists miss key opportunities. I challenge people here to imagine a clearly written book that would seamlessly weave together influential thinkers like Adam Smith, Edmund Burke, Alexis de Tocqueville, and Susan Bordeaux with contemporary figures like Jerry Lewis, Ralph Nader, and George W. Bush. <laughs> Telethons can be erudite and down to earth snarky and passionate, breezy and deep, nailing, thing down, nailing things down while raising more questions than answers. It's a good read, maybe because it's one of those rare books written from the heart and the, and the head over a long period of time. Maybe it's also a good read because even though it's published, it leaves readers with both a sense of mastery and a need to apply this new knowledge to make the world better. Now, I'm gonna, the video I'm going to show um, here is from a talk that Paul was invited to give at Ryerson University in 2005 when he was in the thick of telethons. Uh, for those of you who knew Paul, you'll remember the guy who made us all think. For those of you who didn't know him, I want you to meet a man who never shied away from asking big questions. Um, the video will last about nine minutes, and then I want to have conclude with a few more remarks about what he said and what I think. So. Well, during the latter half of the 20th century, growing numbers of people with disabilities resisted their relegation to social invalidity. They organized themselves into a movement, or to put it more accurately, an assemblage of movements that challenged the dominant views of disability. In place of pathology as the explanation of disabled people's social and economic marginalization, their campaign substituted a minority group perspective. More urgent than the remedial measures that sought to fix individuals, they advocated reform of society through instatement of equal access and reasonable accommodations, along with anti-discrimination protections. Rather than the charity approach beseeching attention to disabled people's needs and social situation, they demanded civil rights enforcement to ensure their access to society. This activism led in the 1980s and 1990s to criticism of and then protests against the telethons. Whereas those broadcasts assumed that affliction and misfortune were inevitably and self-evidently the state of being of anyone with a disability, disabled activists scorned those suppositions as not objective statements of biological facts, but social prejudices that justified discriminatory practices. 
The charities could not ignore the demonstrations or the emergent minority group mentality that fueled them. In fact, some of the agitation came from activist constituents within the organizations themselves. And so, in various ways, the telethons sought to co-opt or criticize, address, assimilate, or adopt the activist perspective. On and off the broadcast, the controversy generated public debate that touched on without deeply exploring, let alone resolving, a clutch of questions. The questions that stand at the core of the modern problem of disability. Is disability inherent defectiveness, socially constructed devaluation, or human variation and difference? What roles and identities have modern social norms and cultural values, public policies and professional practices prescribed for people with disabilities? How did those norms and values influence social arrangements, public policies, and professional practices, to put it the other way around? How, to quote the historian Douglas Bainton, was the modern fundamental binary opposition, normal versus disabled, invented and wielded as what he calls a signifier for relations of power? How do we account for the extraordinary intensification of social anxieties about disability within modern cultures? The creation, as Bainton puts it, of that fundamental binary opposition, normal versus disabled. Other questions. In what ways have people with disabilities embraced or resisted these definitions? How do they attempt to manage or alter their social careers and social identities, and to have an impact on public policies, professional practices, and sociocultural beliefs. And then, what are the real needs and real interests of people with disabilities? And who is qualified to determine them? Who will define who and what they are and can be? What values will shape that definition? in the future. Could citizens with disabilities legitimately demand equal dignity and equal rights while insisting that society provide for their distinctive disability-related needs and alternative modes of functioning as matters of entitlement or as civil, social, or human rights? Were disability rights activists Refusing in their protests against the telephone, were they refusing to acknowledge the inherent suffering of people with certain conditions? And at the same time, could disabled citizens assert their fundamental equality with non disabled citizens if they admitted that some conditions involve intrinsic limitation and suffering? Correspondingly, is it possible for charity publicists to promote amelioration of genuine human suffering without demeaning the people they ostensibly seek to help? Are modern values about need, justice, equality, and difference ultimately compatible with one another or irreconcilably at odds? And in the end, what is the meaning of disability and what is the place of people with disabilities in modern society? All those questions, I think, have been involved in the controversy over telethons. The public clash over the telethons grew out of underlying opposing ideologies, but two facts muddled the argument. The charities never an equal dignity for people with disabilities everywhere. Anyway, you, that gives you a, a flavor of, uh, of Paul Longmore. Um, and uh, 
At the Longmore Institute, we take up the, Paul's provocations like these and in his telethons book by countering the stereotype of pathetic individuals struggling alone. Everything we do aims to showcase the genius, the resourcefulness, the passions of people with disabilities, not as individuals beating the odds, but as, collect of a, as a collective force for positive change. Our projects are taking Paul's notion of social justice to the next level by introducing disabled experts ready to help the unfortunate non-disabled make progress. For example, our exhibit, Patient No More, People with Disabilities Securing Civil Rights, showcased how in 1977, which happened to be the golden days of telethons, disabled activists introduced far-ranging changes that are just beginning to seep in today's, into today's public images. We're working with faculty and students to insert these more positive portrayals into their courses, into history books, and into the media and public conversation. We wonder when the playful forms of access devised by disabled people that made patient, so more, patient no more so unique will find their way into innovative des exhibit design for everyone. Our Superfest International Disability Film Festival, co-hosted with San Francisco's Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired, invites everyone from filmmakers to audience members to reimagine what movie going means. This year's event on October 22nd and 23rd will be bigger than ever and will provide yet more images to counter the damaging portrayals of disabled people on telethons. And if you can't wait until October, um, please come to next month's Longmore Lecture. Um, the brilliant and entertaining Joshua Mealy will speak on how access really happens, disability, technology, and design thinking on March 2nd um, from 4 to 6 in Humanities 587. We'll be sending out more publicity, and you've got some here. Um, a, blind guy, Josh, me, uh, a blind guy, Josh, speaks fluent humanities, technology, engineering, and other languages in ways that invite us to reimagine disability. Now somehow, I always come back to my collection of pirates that has become the Longmore Institute's mascot. I can't help but wonder how telethons might have been different if even for one short moment someone had pulled one of these figures out from her pocket and invited millions of television viewers and all those kids on the shows to embrace their first disability action figure. Just maybe the teacher, the prospective employer, the possible date would find a pirate's peg leg, hooked arm, and eye patch intriguing enough to give disability a second look and with this, the disabled person, a second chance. And maybe too, after years of quietly accepting the telethon message that still lingers, people with disabilities would face the future with the renewed sense of audacity we're known for at the Longmore Institute. Thank you. Now I want to thank everyone for coming and uh, don't forget you can buy books for 30% off. And for those of you that are finding this message so appealing and Paul Longmore's uh, 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 passion so compelling and his uh, deconstruction of society so important, um, please consider donating to the Longmore Institute Endowment, um, the Longmore Fund we set up at the time of uh, Paul Longmore's um, uh, death to memorialize him. We're still building the endowment to really continue the important work of the Institute, and it's so, so important for us. So if you um, um, find that you're drawn by this, please, please support us. Um, I want to, oh, oh and Emily is um, in the back somewhere over there, yeah, and she has forms and all sorts of ways to help you do that. Um, so uh, feel free to talk to me after about the book or the endowment. And um, I'd like to offer a series of special thanks to the people that made this event possible, in addition to you being here. Um, thanks to our student assistants um, in the back, um, and to uh, Emily, of course, our associate director. I want to thank also Academic Technology for recording this event. 
I'd like to thank Debbie Masters of the library um, and the staff of Special Collections for hosting uh, the reception downstairs in room 286. So thank you very, very much for coming and please enjoy the book and keep talking about it and really spread the word, spread the message. Thank you very, very much.